So another episode of the Boss Juice Podcast. We're here with uh, Michael and Ashley from Nally Elias and Associates PC. Uh, Michael is the president, CEO, founder, set this up. Ashley is, um, I don't know if it's a correct title, it's like a vice president, but you're vice president and partner in the business. And um, you guys have been hustling. I've had the good fortune of working with both of you for several years. I've probably known Michael for more than more than 10 years through networking and things like that. So we've been trying to get on this calendar together for a podcast interview and um, it's taken a while, but we were able to pin everybody down and, you know, Dylan, who does all the film production and post-production, things like that with his schedule, Antonino's schedule, my schedule and yours. It's an act of God. Just the simple fact that we're all, we all have asses and seats right now. Right? So this is a good thing. We're going to move forward with this. I want to learn, um, a little bit more, share a little bit more with um, our audience about the way that your your law office is set up, what your forte is, what you focus on. I already know this, but these listeners don't. We want to share that with them. Sure. Go ahead, Michael. You want to oh, start? Our, it, it, and it's a great point you bring up. We are a little different type of a law office because a lot of times when you think of a law practice or a law office, um, it's usually something maybe um, somebody needing a lawyer for a criminal case or divorce or an auto accident case um, or maybe an issue with property, something like that. We have a very, I think, specific emphasis. Um, our emphasis is estate planning, elder law, and estate and trust administration. And they're all interrelated. And Ashley and I, you'll notice after our title, is the designation CELA, C-E-L-A, which stands for Certified Elder Law Attorney. It's one of the few, we're, one of, we're lucky in that we are one of the few areas of the legal profession where we are allowed to say to clients, we are a specialist. We're, our rules of professional conduct frown on that. So, you know, you can tell a client that you emphasize or practice in criminal defense or family law or personal injury, but you are not allowed to call yourself a specialist in that area. We, however, are. Uh, Ashley and I, last March, sat for a very grueling uh, certified elder law attorney exam, and uh, we were told going into it that it had a about 30% passage rate. We both passed it, uh, thankfully. And we found that out at, uh, in May and uh, of, of last year. So about a year ago, we found out about it. So, so that's what we do. And, and um, we look at, because we're dealing with those different types of areas, you know, we're dealing with the client who's coming in in a very emotional situation. They're coming in either in the case of a state or trust administration, they've just lost a loved one and they need to know where do we go from there. In the case of estate planning, uh, a lot of times they're getting older and now they're concerned about passing a legacy on to the next generation. A lot of times, too, we meet with people who maybe they're not getting older, but they're worried about one of their family, close family members. Two, two clients this week whom I met with, uh, they had special needs children and they were just concerned that while they were, both of these clients, I might add, were younger than me, uh, these were married couples, but they wanted to make sure they had put in place proper documents for their special needs ch child or children. And then in the context of elder law, Ashley and I are dealing with the very stressful situation when a family has to uh, deal with a loved one who is in maybe cognitive decline or physical decline. And a lot of times they don't know where to go. A lot of times the dis discussion then is, okay, well, we may have to put mom or dad into some type of an assisted living or long-term care facility. What impact does that have on their assets? What are the legal issues involved with it? So we really deal with people in very raw emotional periods, and we try to really be a trusted advisor to them. I have a question, Mike, on your kind of personal story. So you said you specialize in this elder care law. How did you What's your story? How did you come to this? Is this something you wanted from the get-go? Like when you were in law school, is this what you wanted to achieve? Or did you kind of stumble into this? How did you get to this specialty here? Well, that's, I, I, that's a great question. And it's funny because, so when I was in law school in the late 90s at Duquesne University, um, 
I wasn't sure what area of practice I wanted to go into. I knew I didn't want to be a trial lawyer, although what's, what's interesting about that is the first six or seven years of my career, I tried cases, and I liked it too. Uh, but when I was in law school, at the same time that it happened, my grandfather had to go into a nursing home. We were very close with him. My mother and I lived with him and my grandmother. My grandmother had passed away in 1996. And my mother and my uncles were faced with the very difficult task of putting my grandfather into a long-term care facility. And we didn't know anything, any laws. Back in the late 90s, um, there, was no, there weren't the amount of elder law attorneys as there are now. And so we didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to do. I was in law school, but I had no clue how the Medicaid rules worked. I did not have any, back as far as I was concerned, hey, I'm like, why didn't Medicare pay for it, right? I, my grandfather is a senior citizen. I thought they took care of all of that. So what was interesting was we went through that in 1997, my first year of law school. And then after you get through one year of law school, you're allowed to start taking electives. And one of the electives I took was elder law because I had been through this and I'm like, you know what, I want to learn this. And so I really thought, you know, this is a great area of the law where you can really help people. And it's not bare knuckles litigation. It's actually being an, an advisor to a client, really helping the client. So I, I really started liking it then. And then I took other estate planning courses in uh, law school. So I knew then when I got out of law school in 2000, that was where I was going to start to track my career. And I was very lucky that the first firm that I worked for here in Beaver County basically gave me the freedom to like, yeah, we want you to go ahead and develop that practice. And, you know, we don't do it. So whatever you can do, just go ahead and do it. So I kind of freelanced it on my own. And, uh, and I was lucky. And, and uh, so that's how it happened. Nice. It's interesting to, to hear some of the backdrop of how and why you are where you are. And we'll get into more of that you know, as this interview goes on, this podcast interview. But um, Ashley, uh, so I've had the pleasure of knowing Ashley for probably four years, something like that. And um, I think a lot has, um, a lot of things have transpired. Um, when you came on board, I think things started changing different in a different way, in a, in a good way. Um, I think on the estate planning side, that was a big shot in the arm for Michael and the rest of the team. And I wasn't sure where exactly you started. I remember it had something to do with uh, maybe law enforcement, or the military or something like that. What is your background and why this direction at this point? And let, let me tell you, people, Ashley's a beautiful person inside and out, but don't let the exterior fool you. I'm, t I'm telling you that right now. We have a we have a pit bull here for the right reasons. For the right reasons. Well, I appreciate that. I, w I won't take that offense to that, Absolutely. but... Um, you're, you're correct. I started my legal career in law enforcement um, at the age of 19. I was still in college trying to finish my degree. I ultimately left law enforcement to go to law school. I also went to Duquesne University, um, like Mike. And when I graduated, I ended up as a prosecutor here at Beaver County. So I did that type of work for about five years. And then I ultimately ended up doing defense work at the public defender's office and then ultimately from there went out into private practice and Mike approached me and asked me to come on board and I figured, yeah, you know what, I've been in the government sector for so long. Uh, it, during law school, I was actually working with a, a firm right here in this office actually, the exact place we are, uh, doing some a little bit of estate planning, estate administration as, as a law clerk here, just kind of helping out. And so I had known the area and knew that it was something that I was interested in and could handle. So as I started working with Mike, um, he's taught me so much and I've just kind of blossomed from there. So I really have learned so much from him and everything has just kind of bloomed from there, I should say. Um, we started out, uh, I think when I came on board, it was mostly a state administration that we were handling, basic estate planning stuff. But then as things developed and we looked at getting our CELAs and, and developing a little bit more on the estate planning side and trying to just grow the firm and do some more for clients, things that we saw they were coming in and needed help with their planning and needed help with these elder law situations. And 
we really wanted to be that overall person for them to come to. So just like any other time when you start um, with your career and you start going in the, not another direction, but you have other opportunities pop up in the way that you visualize those things happening versus the way it really rolls out. Um, what kind of things maybe shocked you about getting into this a little bit deeper when it, at the time when it was Nally Law and then became Nally Elias? Um, what, what were the things that um, maybe surprised you as you came in? I would probably say just all the different directions you can go with estate planning and how broad it really is, but how detailed you need to be. Um, you can really get into a lot of different things and, and be creative with their estate planning. You can get creative with trying to get people into placement and doing Medicaid planning and spend down whenever they are in that crisis mode. So there's just a lot of different things that we can do for people that a lot of people don't realize are possibilities. So going off that, what was the transition like from criminal defense? Because I feel like, you know, Mike had said what you do now is really not litigation or like trying cases. It's more so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for lack of a better term, um, paperwork, you know, and stuff like that. Um, what's that transition like? Did you find this more stressful, less stressful? I would say less stressful, um, but different. Uh, a different kind of stress, let's put it that way. You know, in criminal court, you're you're dealing with the courts all the time. You're in court every day. You're fighting people every day, opposing counsel. You're always arguing. You know, you're you're deciding life and death sometimes with with people, and and this is their lives. Not that it's not that way now. You know, you're still doing a lot of very important things for people, and it is a lot of times dependent and affects their life. So it's just in a different way. And we can kind of control what we want to do and how we want to do it a little bit more than I can whenever it's the court kind of choosing when you do things. And this is a different kind of, of closure and satisfaction, I would say. Uh, you know, I feel in the criminal side, you know, you do have a lot of times where people aren't thankful for what you do. But here on this side of things, people are always thankful. We're always helping everybody. I feel like that really makes an impact on people and makes a difference in their lives. So you are probably the top law firm in Beaver County as far as estate planning, elder law, um, those aspects. Where do you, where do you service people? How far out do you want to go? What um, communities, where are you reaching people? Well, it, it's a great question because traditionally, the, you know, the, it's it's amazing how estate planning has evolved because if Ashley or I had come out of law school in the 70s or even the 80s or the 90s and said, we're going to just do an estate planning practice, people have looked at you and said, well, what do you want to, you want to be a bummer? You want to be successful in this, in this profession? You know, it's, it, it's evolved so much that now really, um, you know, pr back in those days, it was very territorial. You know, if you lived in the southern part of Beaver County, chances are you didn't go to have a lawyer in Beaver Falls or Elwood City do your will. Um, that's all changed now. With the amount of clients that we service in Allegheny County, Butler County, Washington County, Lawrence County, even Mercer County, uh, continue to grow because really, whether you live in Moon Township, whether you live in, in Aliquippa, whether you live in uh, Newcastle or, or, um, or Mercer County or, or, or Washington or Burgettstown, you still have the same issues. You still are going to need an estate planning lawyer. You still may need an elder law lawyer to help you if those type of issues come up. And definitely, after a person passes away, you'll need some lawyer to guide you through the process. Particularly as Pennsylvanians, we are very unique. We're one of only six states, for example, that has an inheritance tax. Um, in the United States, there are 14 um, states that have an estate tax, and plus the District of Columbia, but 30, 30 to 31 states do not tax anything. So we are very unique. There's a lot of unique things that someone experiences going through the uh, settlement of a loved one's affairs. So really geographically, we, we look at it as, you know, borders don't 
Don't bother us. I know there was always the joke of you couldn't get someone in this part of Beaver County to go across the Ohio River to patronize a business. Uh, so, or, go, you know, go to a doctor or whatever. That's all changed now. People want to go where they are going to get the best, you know, the, 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 the highest quality service that they can get and address their important needs. So if it means somebody from, you know, Robinson Township or Kennedy Township or, or the South Hills coming up here to Beaver County to go and meet with, with us, so be it. So what's like the average age of your client? So the reason I'm asking is in previous interviews we've done, a lot of different business owners have, have said that they've started the succession plan with their kids about taking over the business. And I'm sure you guys can speak more about that. And that's probably a whole will in a state planning you know, situation. But what is the average like age of your clientele? Well, that's a great question. We're getting, when I look at just on a weekly basis, who Ashley and I service, and particularly on the estate planning end, definitely the baby boomers are by far the largest demographic. However, what we're noticing is, you know, we're getting more and more younger families, um, sort of millennials now who are settling down, they're having children, and now they want to handle their estate planning affairs. Um, so, but, but by, by and large, the baby boomers make up the largest demographic of, of our client base, particularly with regard to estate planning. And really, because I look at it for a couple reasons, number one, you know, they are retiring, uh, in mass now because I think, uh, and Ashley and I do seminars and one of the slides that we show our audience in our seminars is that, you know, every day for the next few years, there's going to be uh, what, like five or ten thousand baby boomers turning sixty-five. You know, it's just it, so. So with that comes a lot of concerns, and it's interesting. When I got into this profession in two thousand, predominantly I was servicing the World War II and the Korean War generation, and it's interesting. Their their focus was, hey, I worked so hard over my life to accumulate a little bit. And so I want to just make sure it's there to leave it to somebody. And hence, that's why elder law became so popular. Well, now the focus is shifting with the baby boomers. They've done more than accumulated. They've, they've, they've done extremely well in accumulating wealth. So now their focus is, I want to make sure that what I am leaving, I know I'm going to be leaving something. I want to make sure that's preserved in that next generation. So they're concerned about their children and grandchildren preserving their inheritance. So estate planning now is getting a lot more involved and a lot more detailed because the baby boomers are trying to put in place estate planning devices that are going to go beyond a generation and that will be there. So Ashley, um, these families and individuals that Mike references, what can they expect when they call here? What's the process from like start to, I don't want to say finish, but give us a little step-by-step -step on what a, what a new prospective client could expect. Yeah, absolutely. So as soon as they get scheduled with one of us, <clears throat> uh, we end up sending out what one of our questionnaires. So whether they're here for estate planning, estate administration, trust administration, uh, more on the estate planning side, we'll send them a questionnaire so that they can fill that out and bring it with them. And that saves us a lot of time at that initial meeting, collecting just basic information on them and about their assets so that we kind of have a fresh start going in. We can take a look at that and maximize our time with them. So on that first initial appointment is where we kind of get to know them, what their goals are, what they want to do with their assets, what assets they do have, how to protect them, what's the best way to get them to that next generation. And then we kind of formulate a plan on what all documents we need to do to create that plan for them. From there, we'll, we'll schedule a next meeting for us to, to meet with them again, usually about four weeks out so that we have time to do some drafting. Uh, sometimes that next meeting can be a signing meeting. Other times we might need a little bit more time with them just to create this plan. So it's kind of individualistic at that point in time. But usually we're, we're getting close to the signing meeting. Um, one thing that we're pretty happy about is we've got our signing meetings now where we walk in with this beautiful binder that they're going to ultimately get with all their documents ready to go so that we can review it with them, make sure it's how they want everything. They sign it there, and then we can get that deliverable to them a lot quicker. 
Um, but that's typically our process. Like I said, sometimes it'll take a couple more appointments depending on how detailed we need to get or how much information that maybe they didn't have in that first meeting. Um, but that's typically our, our process. So just out of curiosity, how customizable are these wills or estates? You know, like, are there certain regulations that state that you can only give a certain amount or have a certain amount or X, Y, Z, or is it really like, if I'm creating my own, can I come with you and sky's the limit, create whatever I wanted to create? I would say, yeah, absolutely. You can be, get very individualistic. So there's no set, you can only leave this amount to this person or that to that person. You can leave it to whomever you want. You can leave it to charities. You can um, put them into a trust. You can create pet trusts so somebody can take care of your pets when you're gone. So there's a lot of neat things that you can do. You can dictate how people get those assets, whether it's outright in a trust, if it's at stages or ages. So you can kind of control a little bit more even after you're gone. So on that topic, again, this is kind of a funny question, but I just watched the movie Murder Mystery. And in there, the whole, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but no. it's it, it. it's a comedy like murder movie with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. But they, the whole plot, not to ruin it, but there's a murder that happens on this this yacht as he's about to, this, this very wealthy man is about to sign his will. <laughs> And at the end of the, you know, uh, film, you find out, it's kind of a spoiler alert, but the, the motive is that in French law, where they're, they're, they're in Europe, that if there's no will, the estate goes to like the firstborn son or something like that. I don't know the, the legality of that, but are there laws and regulations in Pennsylvania similar yes. to that? Okay. Yes, there's an intestate statute. So if you die without a will that statue is going to control who inherits from you. So those people might be individuals that you don't know, that you don't want anything to do with. Maybe they're estranged from you. So that's why it's important to make sure that you put forth what your wishes are so you can control it rather than a statute. Michael, what would you um, recommend age-wise for people to check in? Um, when should they start? When should they set an appointment to get in here and, and at least have a conversation? Well, it's interesting, uh, Sean, I, I, I say any age, 21, 22, you know, because here's the thing, the, the thing that we try to impress upon younger people is not even just making a will, but think about it. There's a lot of our younger clients, a lot of young people tend to, you know, a lot of them are still in school. A lot of them like to travel. Uh, some of them study abroad. So the, the problem that may be created is, you know, what if that, what if uh, a 21 year old college student is traveling abroad and they get sick, something happens to them? Well, they need to have documents in place to make sure they're designating perhaps their parents, their older brother, their older sister, someone that could make decisions for them if they become incapacitated. And there's a lot of, we, we unfortunately, you know, Ashley was talking about the Pennsylvania intestacy statute. We have run into a number of heartbreaking situations where young parents tragically pass away and what's left behind is a complete mess. You know, and it's interesting that intestacy statute, I'm dealing with it right now because a lot of people don't understand how that statute works. We have a, a very sad situation where... A gentleman passed away, happily married, but he and his he and his spouse had no children. Okay, and um, and so the primary asset that was left to his wife was their home. And of course, in Pennsylvania, when you do not have a will, as Ashley mentioned, our intestacy statute determines who are the heirs. If you polled probably 99% of people would say, okay, how do you think the intestacy statute operates in that fact pattern? You've got a husband who passed away. He survived by his wife, maybe a couple stepchildren, a couple of siblings, and his parents. Probably 99% of the audience whom you'd poll would say it would go to his wife, right? That's not how the intestacy statute works, however. And in that situation, the wife has to share the estate with the parents of the deceased spouse. 
because they don't have any children. There were no children in that case. It goes the other direction. Exactly. Now, what made that a tragic situation is this was an individual who had an unfortunately strained relationship with those parents. So as Ashley mentioned, you now have somebody, or more than somebody, (laughs) coming in and inheriting a share of an estate of someone they really didn't have a good relationship with. While the person who had the good relationship and who's been paying the bills really gets shorted. So I didn't mean to, to go off on a tangent, but the point is younger people, in my opinion, there's the same urgency there to, to handle your estate planning affairs as someone who is approaching 70 or 80. And if you have children, you should also be doing the, that, that type of planning because otherwise, who, who decides who's going to take care of your children? Mm-hmm. It's not going to be you. Yeah. It might not be your spouse. It's probably going to be the court. So if you have kids, you absolutely need to get in here and have your estate planning stuff done. Are, those, are estate plans, are they amendable? So like if, if someone came in at a young age and, you know, they got, you know, they get married, can they amend that to include their wife or what if they get divorced? How does that work? As long as they are capacitated, they can amend their will, any of their documents, anytime they want, other than there are exceptions for irrevocable trust, which is a whole nother topic. But when we're talking your basic documents, wills and power of attorneys, they have the right to revoke and terminate those anytime that they want, change them how they want again, as long as they're still capacitated to do so. So with that being said, this is a good segue into the next question. Um, how often should uh, an estate plan wills, sh- how, how often should they be revisited? And what if another attorney, another law office prepared it? Can you help them? Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that we do is we, we recommend to our clients a couple things. Number one, one of the things that Ashley and I started a couple of years ago is a, we call it a review track, which is when we do estate planning documents for a client and we will put them on a track that if we do not hear from them in three years, we will reach out to them with a postcard that just says, would you like to come back and do a free review? The reason why we do that is because typically it's recommended every three years you revisit your estate planning or if something in the intervening years happens significantly that changes your situation, perhaps a death of a loved one, disability of a loved one, a large windfall or inheritance, or a change in employment, or, you know, like Ashley mentioned, a divorce situation where there's a change in, in, in family dynamics. Those are all circumstances that should precipitate a review meeting. And a lot of times... Clients will come to us who had estate planning documents maybe prepared by other lawyers many years ago. Uh, There's nothing wrong with them coming to us. The main thing there from an an ethical or professional responsibility standpoint is we obviously cannot serve as someone who is currently being serviced by another colleague of ours. That's not ethical. Um, But if it's a situation where a lot of times we've had clients who have done wills with our colleagues who've passed away or retired and aren't practicing anymore. You know, it's a great opportunity. If they come to us, we can review everything and and update things for them. So how does the litigation around that work? So like my understanding of of law, you know, is more so business law. So like, you know, I get a client, they sign a contract and we negotiate terms on that contract. And that contract is is an agreement between myself and that client and a third party may, you know, litigate or, you know, mediate any issues between that contract. With an estate or a will, it, it's a contract between myself, basically. Like, like who is, or is it between myself and the state of Pennsylvania? Like, who is, who is admitting, or who's litigating that? Who's controlling that? Usually it's the heirs who step in and litigate something to say either maybe there was some undue influence. I was disinherited because my sibling talked my parent into doing that. Um, usually you're going to see that from heirs that are not happy with what they're getting or think that there's some dishonesty that had gone on. So since you're going to be in Europe during the St. Rocco (laughs) Festival, um, (laughs) your grandma is probably going to disassociate with you. (laughs) Just letting you know. Shame on you. (laughs) 100%, yeah. Just to kind of fill you guys in, I'm going to Europe this summer, and uh, my very Italian family, and we, um, you know, come from – 
you know, every summer in August, there is the St. Rocco Festival. Where my We know it really well. Do you? We have our own little party and get together uh, to commemorate San Rocco. There you go. Um, so even though he he's the patron saint of the town up the road from us that in Italy where my family's from, um, we we you know we celebrate that every year. That's an awesome celebration, yeah. And really a great um, if you've anybody's uh, read up on on uh, San Rocco. It's an int- interesting uh, read. Um, he was a French nobleman who I know we're not. I know we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> law. And now you got me on to um, 13th or 14th century uh, figures. But uh, very interesting person. Uh, yeah, absolutely. My family takes it very seriously, and my grandmother is upset that I'm missing it. So as you're right. Man, I should as probably she get, should be, man. I should get the will <laughs> locked down. <laughs> or do something really nice for her. True. That, that works out as well. So there's just so many different directions we could go with this podcast interview, and it was nice to learn a little bit about your backgrounds and, you know, the types of clients that you serve, who ought to be here, when should they talk to you? What does Nally Elias look like, say, in the next couple of years? And I just know by by knowing you and, and you know, knowing the, the law firm here, um, so much has changed already in the last few years. Say in two or three more years, what, what's the vision? What are your goals? Well, one of the things we're really blessed in that, you know, in a, in a few months, we're going to have a very talented young lady joining us who right now is on a, a uh, an eight to 10 week sabbatical to study for the bar exam, and that's Jocelyn Sudar. Jocelyn is, has been with us really since in, in, full time as an, as an assistant since 2018. However, what is interesting about her is she's actually trained three lawyers uh, on how to handle estates. So effectively, when she becomes licensed in October, when she passes the bar exam, she'll be jumping right, she'll be diving right in. And um, anybody that's ever worked with her, our clients who we've handled estates for and estate planning, um, they've all kind of remarked the same way. They're like, please don't let this woman get away from you, whatever you do. And so we're really, really thankful. So our vision is we have her um, we also have two other part-time attorneys right now working for us. And really what we want to do is just deliver the best quality we can to our region in estate planning, elder law, and estate and trust administration. Because when you think about it, we are probably the only area of the law that every single human being needs this type of a lawyer. Because unfortunately, you know, we all pass away. There's an 80% probability, according to one study, that we're going to need long-term care. Um, And, you know, everybody needs to do planning. So it's, and it doesn't discriminate. It's funny because the biggest nightmares of estate administrations have been the most wealthy. You know, you've heard about uh, Aretha Franklin, what found a paper or written, handwritten, or what we call a holographic will in her couch. Howard Hughes had all these fake wills turning up. None of them were, were legitimate. Prince died without a will. Uh, Bob Marley, same thing. So there's just a number of famous people you would think, wow, they had all the means. They had all the, the advisors and the people around them. And they didn't get their affairs in order. So we, re- we feel really good about the next few years. You know, and like every other business, every other professional firm, you know, prior to our meeting today, we had a, a little a conversation about just how challenging that could be at times, you know, dealing with staff issues. I know every small business is dealing with it, but we feel really good going into the next few years with Jocelyn uh, joining us and just the prospect of servicing, you know, a lot of people in the area. What has been like the, if you don't mind sharing the craziest horror story or most interesting kind of um, situation you've seen? I know you You'd mentioned kind of a sad situation earlier, but you know, is there something that stands out to you as like, wow, I hope that never happens to someone else like ever again? Ashley, you've gotten yeah. some of the crazy ones. You, yeah. I managed to get shielded <laughs> from that in the last couple of years. So. Yeah, I tend to. Everything <laughs> gravitates toward me. That's odd, but um, kind of similar to his last story. I did have a client in which a, a spouse died unexpectedly. It was the wife. They had two children, and again, like he had mentioned, the, the intestate statute, uh, we had a spouse, and, and here we had two children. So 
the spouse didn't get everything. His kids were minors and he had to set up actual accounts to go to those minor children with money that, you know, he really needed to kind of deal with some of the things. The house was still in the wife's name only. So we had to open a full administration just because of that. Um, so it's, it was really challenging for him. Obviously it's unexpected. He just lost his wife. He's got to console his two young minor children. And now he's got to deal with this estate administration and, you know, navigate that. Whereas if they had done a little bit of planning that could have been a, a little bit of an easier time and given him the ability to just mourn rather than having to deal with all of that. So that was, um, quite the challenge. I, I felt extremely terrible for him and, in the end, though, I was, you know, I felt very good that I was able to help him through that and kind of, you know, make sure that he was in good hands and that we could, you know, do our best to kind of take some of that strain and stress from him. So I think in October coming up, this will probably be two years where you've been hosting different seminars to help educate people first off. And, um, you know, I've, I've sat in on a couple of those, and I think the engagement is really good. A lot of great questions, and I think a lot of times people are apprehensive to ask a question. And when they sit in a room full of other people, they don't know. Um, but I think the information sharing has been so good. Um, the seminars that you host, talk a little bit about those. Ashley, you want to start on sure, that? Sure, yeah. Talk about the seminars. So we have at least one yeah. seminar here in this room, uh, which is in our office building, so we you don't have to go far. Um, and we do one every month. We alternate the, the topic. So one month, it's going to be strictly estate planning, your basic documents. We talk about trusts. Uh, the other seminar that we do, again, alternating, is going to be more centered on asset protection and elder law. So we try to get a little bit of both worlds out there and have every other month the ability for someone to come in and sign up. Our maximum is usually about 10 to 12 people. We have postings on our Facebook page, on our website for people to be able to sign up for the seminars. It's free. Uh, you get some, some coffee and a little bit of you know refreshments and things like that for free. You come in, you listen, you ask your questions. It kind of kickstarts and gets us to the ability to get that information out to a larger group of people rather than individuals. So it's it's worked out pretty well. Um, right now we're alternating who does it. We used to do them together um, until we can get Joss back and uh, in in the office from her studying. It's going to be that way. But once she comes back, we hope to go back to doing it together. But right now we at least are still able to hold those every single month. And uh, so, yeah, anybody who needs that or is interested in that, we encourage them to call in and we can get you on whichever one, you know, you want to be. By all means, come to both. <laughs> so, again, listening to the questions that pop up, they're things that really um, cause you to think mm -hmm. and think, wow, I didn't even realize that was a situation that somebody would be, through, be going through. And then you to provide some examples during, you'll talk about, um, you know, a husband and wife, and maybe there was a, a marriage with children before that. And there's, there's just, I don't think people realize how complicated it gets. I think on the surface, when you look at uh, having an estate plan or a will, but when you start factoring in all those different family dynamics, and Antonino asked, hey, how flexible, how, how customized can this process be? It's almost like, it, it's mind boggling to me to see how many different options, how many different family situations pop up. It's just crazy. But I think your seminars have been a great way, as you said, Ashley, to, to reach a, a lot of people during one great session. And um, the fact that you've committed to doing these monthly, I think is great. And you can search and find Nally Elias pretty quickly on the web and find out when their next seminars are coming up. Yeah, and the other great thing is, too, if you happen to be one of those individuals who you don't want to talk in groups, you don't want to talk about your situation, you, you don't have to. So after that seminar, we set up our appointments with that individual to sit down with them face-to-face, -face, just them, to talk about their situations, their goals, and what it is that they need to do. So they can get all of the information, get an understanding of everything, maybe formulate those questions they want to ask, maybe in private, and then we can, you know, have those discussions, but at least they've got the, the groundwork when they come in the next time. So we've talked a lot about elder law and estate planning. 
I want to circle in on the business side of running a law firm. So there's a lot of kids who grow up, they want to go to law school and maybe they want to own their own own practice. How easy is it to start a law firm? (laughs) Well, I mean, Antonino, it's, it, it's something that is, I will tell you just from my personal experience, it's easy to start one, but the, big challenge that you have is, and and think about it in the context of how does a professional firm like a group of physicians or a group of accountants or or a group of lawyers, a law firm, how does it differ from a, a business? And the biggest issue is that we not only have to wear the hat of servicing the client, we've got to be the CEO, the CFO, the director of marketing. We've got to wear all of those hats. So one piece of advice that I would say to a young person who wants to start a law firm, and by the way, I will say this, there is, in, in, and Ashley kind of alluded to it earlier, there is a lot of good in having the type of practice we do and having a smaller practice because there is flexibility. You know, um, I have, I'm, uh, we're both proud to say we've never had to miss one of our kids' sporting events because of this office. Never. Uh, I had to come late to a couple of them, but the point is that there's a lot of good that comes that that can come out of this. But one but one piece of advice I would give to say a young lawyer is partner with someone from the beginning. It is very very difficult to go it alone or work for a firm first and then start your own practice thereafter. Um, I would not just come right out of law school and start my own solo practice because without at least the experience of working for a firm first, like I had, um, or kind of having someone else with you that you can bounce ideas off of from the beginning, kind of stumbling and you know learning to walk together, I think it's very, very tough. So that would be my one piece of advice that I would give somebody. Um, It is challenging because in the legal profession, it is not like financial services, for example, where, you know, if I have a client whom I've had for years, I'm continuing to, to have revenue off that client. And as long as I keep that client, then I could, you know, get more clients. With us, the old a lot of a lot of financial advisors always jokingly, although they correctly say, "You lawyers eat what you kill." And that's exactly right because just because we serviced this client last month doesn't mean that client's going to come back to us, or doesn't mean that that client's going to tell some two or three or four or five other people, "Hey, we really like Nally Elias. Come to them." So, um, or go to them. So uh, there is a lot of pressure in running a law practice. And then, of course, like any other business, you're dealing with the issues of the employees and the staff and having to train them. And really, you know, the the one difference, there, there is a major difference between a firm like ours and a litigation firm. So if you look at a litigation firm, you typically will have really more, as many lawyers as you have support staff because, you know, the lawyer is the one who's going to be in discovery depositions and in in court and and review and meeting with the client to elicit important facts that they need in support of or in defense of a, a, a legal claim. With what we do, we are very staff dependent. So literally, when you look at it, we have as much staff as a seven or eight attorney litigation firm because we need the staff to properly handle the administration of estates and trusts and also a lot of the paperwork when we're doing, say, for example, a Medicaid case and all the drafting that we need to do on estate planning documents. So the challenge that creates is really finding the right people to not only understand what their roles are, but buy in too and and realize, hey, we're part of something bigger. You know, we have to make sure we're doing things properly and and functioning properly. So Michael, your career path has been um, this direction for a long time. Ashley, when we first asked you about your background and, you know, with the law enforcement piece and and that side of it, how did that sort of background prepare you for this? How does this help you 
helping these families with their state planning and elder law and things like that. Absolutely. Well, dealing with the type of job that I had in, in law enforcement, plus in the courthouse when I was a prosecutor and a defense attorney, you know, you're dealing with the public a lot. You're still needing to gather the information, ask the right questions, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, I do still need to go into court from time to time doing different motions and things like that with regard to a state administration, some guardianships and things like that. Um, so being comfortable in the court, that's helped me as well. Um, I would say on a personal level, this type of work is is in line for me because, you know, Mike talked about his situation with his grandfather needing to go into long-term care. Um, my mother, who is a saint, has taken care of literally every elderly person in my family. So I have lived and watched what that's like for people and how much work it is for them to be able to care for a family member who can't take care of themselves anymore. Um, one of which was her own father. He was able to stay in his home. She lived close by, so she would go down and take care of him every day. And then my grandfather, who was my dad's dad, actually moved in with us. I was still in high school and he had dementia. So I saw what that effect has on people and how difficult it is to manage that disease. And so, you know, it, it does have meaning to me to be able to sit down with people and talk with them about the things they're going through. Um, you know, I lost my father at, at probably about 15 years ago, 14. Um, so, you know, I can really understand where people come from, both on the elder law side, the estate administration, you know, estate planning. I've, I've done my own, you know, I I practice what I preach. So I make sure that I have everything set up for my children the way it needs to be. And they're going to be taken care of by who I want them to be. So it really helps me from all of those backgrounds, you know, dealing with people, collecting the right information, being comfortable in those situations and kind of being able to understand what people are going through. That's awesome. For real. So when does a will kick in? So like just out of curiosity and you gave the example of, you know, someone moving in to your home uh, when you were a child and your mother taking care of them. Can a will be like, can I set aside money for like that scenario? Like that way it's not a, you know, I don't, I don't want to use the term burden, but I mean, it could be a financial burden to some people to kind of have to take over. So in that situation, yeah, what you're going to do is the will takes effect and, and kind of is administered when someone passes away. So you need to have your power of attorneys in place that allow somebody to act as the agent to manage your finances and your health care in the event that you do become incapacitated or you need help doing those things. So that's the document that's going to control in those scenarios. And they're going to be using your assets to help take care of you. So we talk about how it's important to name the right individuals, right? So we don't want people taking advantage of our finances and the situations. So uh, your power of attorneys is what's going to help that person be able to manage that. And then again, when you're going into long-term care, it's going to be your power of attorney usually that's helping to make that process a little easier on you. And so going off that question about a power of attorney. So what I'm curious about is let's say, Ashley, I assign you as my power of attorney uh, and Mike sets up that whole arrangement and you know, uh, I'm sick or something happens, who is in, like, do you have full control to enforce that or is Mike kind of the governing force? I guess the question I'm asking is, is there auditing around that? Because, you know, how do you prevent people from taking advantage? Unless there's a guardian in place, uh, that's where the courts are going to monitor that because they have to file reports every year. When it's just an agent, the only time that there's really monitoring if somebody, you know, clues the court into that there's an issue. So the attorney's not monitoring that. The attorney is not involved. Once that's in place, you've got to really trust that agent under your power of attorney. But again, you know, if another family member or maybe, you know, um, another friend sees something that they think isn't right, they can always, you know, report that. There's adult protective services. There's a bunch of agencies out there that are to help protect that from happening. But when it's just a power of attorney, they've got to be clued into it at some stage. There's not really anyone monitoring or overseeing that. I think to um, the other circles that you guys are both in as far as, so you're dealing with families, right? And when um, a scenario happens, the inevitable, and you've got to execute 
these wills. You've got to, you know, make everything come together for these families. You're dealing with other resources too, from financial advisors to um, tax people to who, who all do you work with in those circles and, and how does, how do you help them? Well, one of the things that we do, Sean, is that we practice what we call collaborative estate planning, which is we welcome the clients to involve their adv- their advisors, particularly their financial advisor and their accountant in any of our meetings and discussions. We, we have found that the financial advisor in particular is probably the one of the most valuable people in the room. And a lot of times financial advisors are the ones spearheading their clients to get this estate planning done. For example, earlier this week, we met with a wonderful couple who was referred to us by a local financial advisor who has come to every meeting. He's been involved in every meeting. And it was really a very nice thing because we met three times with this couple. This, they were one of the ones I had mentioned earlier that had a special needs child. So we did special needs planning for the child. And it was, it was amazing. The greatest compliment I think we could have gotten from any client and get from a client is you guys made this so easy and enjoyable. And so, and, and the advisor said the same exact thing. He said, boy, this really worked out well. And it was the communication, you know, with the clients and the advisor. It, everything got set up very nicely for this, for this couple. So we really, really like collaborative practice with other professionals. Now, of course, the client ultimately, because of our confidentiality rules under our rules of professional conduct, the client has to consent to it. But 99 times out of 100, the client is the one driving the meeting and asking, hey, can my CPA or my tax accountant or my financial advisor or my insurance advisor be present in the meeting? And we're like, absolutely. You're the one that kind of controls that. So I feel like that's added value that's hard to quantify. It's hard to put a dollar amount on that piece of knowledge. We're able to communicate, rope all those pieces together to make a smooth at the end of the day, a smooth process for the family. Right, exactly. And then the other thing too is from the other advisor's perspective, they are looking at us because what's what's interesting, and I've been, and I'm sure you've been in these meetings before too, all of you guys in business, where you'll start to be, you know, there, there, there were those meetings where, okay, you're sitting back and wondering, is this nothing more than someone trying to show they're the smartest person in the room, Right not good at all for servicing a client. It's it's not about what, you know, okay, let me be the lawyer and show that I know more than this advisor or this CPA, okay? A lot of times the lawyer is probably the least, knows the least anyway. But it uh, the idea is if you're working collaboratively, like you said, Sean, the client is going to walk away from that saying, wow, there's there's a lot of added value and everyone in my team is working together. Now that looks good for everybody. So it, it, it really is, to me, it, it makes sense. So what, what do you think, in, your, in both of yours' opinion, what makes a, a good attorney? So if someone was coming up through law school and they wanted to you know, start their own law firm, become an attorney, um, let's just say specific, specifically in your field, uh, in elder care, is it more about compassion? Is it more about knowing the laws? Like what... What may, what in your opinion, what makes someone uh, good at what you guys do? Well, it's interesting, uh, Antonino. We spoke uh, earlier about Jocelyn Sudar, and a couple weeks ago, Ashley and I and uh, and our families went to attend her graduation ceremony at uh, the Duquesne University uh, Thomas Klein School of Law. And Thomas Klein was one of the speakers, um, as he had sponsored has sponsored the law school. And what Tom mentioned that really stuck with me was whatever, wherever you end up and no matter how profitable or not profitable your law practice is, you know, your, your integrity is probably the most important thing. You know, there have been times in our careers where mistakes have been made. But it's interesting, a client, if you basically catch it and, and do everything in your power to fix it and be honest and upfront with a client, it goes a long way. So integrity is so important. You know, we ultimately, you can learn 
different areas of practice. You know, Ashley came from a criminal background. I came from, you know, the, the firm that I worked at, a very, very good firm here in Beaver County. I did both litigation, I did personal injury, and I did what I do now. So ultimately, anybody, you know, as, as a lawyer, as someone with an advanced degree, you can learn this. But integrity is something that can you can lose that and never get it back. So it's something that's extremely important. I would concur with the integrity part. Uh, I think another component that Mike and I like to really stay up on is all the changing and CLE. So we always have to be learning new things, keeping up on all the changes. Uh, we do CLEs <clears throat> through NBI. We make sure that we attend all of them. Now as CELAs, we have additional credits that we have to get within that field alone. So I think it's important to, you know, stay up on everything, make sure you know what's new and upcoming, what other, you know, products and things that you can do with, for people. And of course, listening to the client and what they want and what they need. I think that goes a long, long way with people. You know, there's all kinds of professions that you go to them and you say, this is what I want and what I need. And they said, no, this is what you need instead. We don't do that. We, we listen to our clients and we help them meet the goals that they have. And we do that with our integrity and with the knowledge that we have and that we continue to develop. Reputation is everything. And I think, you know, having integrity and then, you know, you're, you have a very good reputation about knowing estate planning and elder law. So yeah, I, I, that does go a long way. And I think too, that, you know, after you help a family or an individual, using them as an ambassador for you, a referral source, I think is a huge deal because they've already had the firsthand experience of getting to not only see how you work, but learn your personalities and where your focus is on them as an individual or a family. I think that that speaks volumes too. And that's one of the things I hope to do through um, this Boss Juice podcast episode is not only make people aware of the law firm, but also give them a little taste of what you two are all about. Um, attorneys, you know, there's always this negative connotation. They're here to take all your money, do all this sort of stuff. I think that um, with this law firm, it's, I mean, it speaks volumes, the way that you treat people, the way you care for people, and the simple fact that you don't practice anything else. It's not drunk driving and divorce and a, a lot of other pieces. You're solely focused on helping these people get through probably one of the most and preparing for one of the most traumatic times in their lives. And that's, that's a lot of pressure. Um, besides that pressure, I'm going to shift gears real quick, and then we're going to start wrapping this up. But you had mentioned, Ashley, about, um, you know, the kids, the families, the simple fact that, Michael, you said you're able to make most of the sports games and any other event that your kids are involved with. I think that's another piece that speaks so heavily in favor of both of you is that's super important. The business and, and serving people is super important, but man, at the end of the day, your family really, without them, nothing else really matters. So being flexible, talk a little tiny bit about what that means to both of you. Ashley, you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just wanted to kind of touch on that last topic that you said. Thank you so much for all your kind words. And as a small business, you know, we do work a lot off of referrals and that is the best compliment we can get is a lot of our clients are from other clients. So we, we really appreciate everyone who does that and you getting the word out there. Um, but as far as flexibility in families, yes, I've, I've always said in a couple of our other videos that we have done, you know, the kids is most important, protecting them, your families are important. And that's what's so, so great about us working together is because we both feel that way. Um, we're very family oriented. We make sure that, you know, our families are taken care of and that our entire life isn't just being a lawyer. You know, we want to be at those sporting events. We want to be at their dances. We want to be at their plays and their shows. And, you know, we have great spouses that are supportive of us here and at home. So it all really comes together nicely. Our families are very close as well. So that helps as, as, as well. It's really kind of like we've adopted each other into our own families. <laughs> Our kids are, are very close to each other as well. So, um, you know, it all kind of works out so great. It does work out great, and it, and it has to. Otherwise, you know, when I worked in the corporate world, there were so many things I loved about it, and then there were other things that I thought, man, I could just, you know, you can do without. And just because I exited the corporate world, that doesn't mean a lot of that goes away. Right. Some of it does, but in others, it's just wrapped up in different boxes, 
right? But I think the thing is, too, when your name is on the door, you handle things differently. You have to. Even Antonina was talking earlier just about, you know, different dynamics within his business and different pieces that you got to deal with and address. It's it's um, something that we're all human, basically, and we're exposing a lot of that that human side of it. You two both have um, very special skill sets and, and education and, and backgrounds that I think are just you're geared to help people. Um, Antonino, always, we always wrap up with uh, one of those questions. You want to go with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we talked a good bit about law. We talked a bit about business and, you know, the, the business side of running a law firm and whatnot. So this last question that we, uh, we always like to ask, and it's to, we like to gear this towards young entrepreneurs or people who want to start a business. So that question is, if you can give one word of advice to a young entrepreneur or someone who wants to start a business, what would that be? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I would say, first of all, um, the, one, the one word of advice is if you have a, an idea or, you know, a dream as a young entrepreneur, do it. And here's why. Because, and it's funny, because when, I was, when we were starting the office at the beginning, at the end of 2007, um, that whole year, I'd say about half of that whole year, I wasn't sure whether or not what I was going to do. And I'll never forget, I was at a function, uh, a little wine get-together with Jocelyn's dad, and he made a comment. He goes, you know, when you get the itch, scratch it. So one of the things is, even if you, even if you fail or even if you don't succeed, you're never going to regret trying it, right? Because, you know, and I'll give another example just from personal experience. Um, and it kind of ties in what we were talking about earlier with, just, with family and the balance between the profession and, and family. But about 11 years ago, I was, I was a poster child for burnout because, again, being a sole practitioner, didn't have a lot of staff. I was coming in on weekends. I was, com- I was working at nights. And, of course, you know, we, at that time, we didn't have any children. So this, this basically was our life. And I started to look at other avenues, possibly going into the financial services industry. So I actually got licensed. I, I got my insurance license. And it, it turned out to be basically what I would consider to be a failure. And, and thankfully, while I was stumbling on that, the law practice got better. Ultimately, we, we got more personnel and all that. But so, the, so even though... Someone might look at that period and say, boy, that was a total failure and a waste of time. Yeah, but at least I, I did it, right? I, I pursued it. I saw that it wasn't for me. I, I kind of dove in and, and saw, hey, firsthand, no, this is really not what I thought it would be. I'm, I'm, I'm in a better situation where I'm at now. So, you know, my advice to an up-and-coming entrepreneur, do it. Because even if, you, if it's not what you think it is, You'll never look back on life 10, 20, 30, or 40 years down the line and have regrets of, you know, I could have gotten in that business, but you won't have those regrets. That failure, so to speak, that you're talking about, is not really a failure to me. I think, look, that's your street smarts. Those are things that you know, now you know more. And I think when we talked about, you know, helping these families and bringing that added value, you're familiar with terms. You're familiar with um, a lot of the pieces that would be important from a financial standpoint or a tax standpoint so or an insurance standpoint. I think those are all things that help shape you as you go. Ashley, your, your response to that same question, Absolutely. what kind of advice would you give? So he kind of took the words out of my mouth because I was going to say when you get a chance, take it because the chances that you don't take are the ones you're going to regret. And so my experience of how I even ended up here was um, I did take a chance. So I left the district attorney's office after five years. I had a great career there and I always wanted to go to the FBI. So I did. I applied. It took me two years. I ended up going to the academy. I graduated. I got out. They sent me to Miami. And while I did that, I, I found that it wasn't the right move for my family. And this kind of goes back into why family is so important. So I resigned and came back here. And that's ultimately f- was for my family. So my immediate family, my husband, my, my child at the time. And it's what opened the door for me to come on with Mike and to learn all of this and become a part of this. 
So again, although it didn't work out and I took a big leap of faith there, um, I still don't regret it because it was a big chance. It was something I needed to do and prove to myself and it ended up not being what I thought it was going to be, but it opened my door to here and to everything I'm doing and, and what I'm you know all about now. So it all was for good purpose and everything happens for a reason. I think it's great. Antonina, what do you have to share? Anything? No, I, I actually, that's great advice. I always say that, you know, I, Sean's heard me say this all the time, but every time someone asks me that question, I always say that I'm young and like I've, I've had two or three failures in business before I kind of stumbled across a business that became something. And the best benefit for me is that time is on my side. You know, I have the time to fail and try things, you know, so um, and I, I, I admire what you guys do because I think it's interesting because you both kind of took this leap of faith into a business when you had uh, family and kids and stuff like that, something to lose where, you know, me, I always say like, I have nothing to lose. I, I say to Sean all the time, like if I fail tomorrow, like I, I'll go live with my parents. I'll go sleep in their basement. <laughs> like, I, like I got nothing to lose, you know? <laughs> so I admire what you guys do and thanks for coming Appreciate on the show. It. No, thanks for thanks having for us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Uh, it was wonderful. Just piggyback on this real quick. I think I'm on the other end. You know, Antonino is, is, is my younger, my younger half here. Right. I think on the other side of it, I think to people that are further along in their careers, um, any time is a good time. You know, the thing is you, one of you, both of you in different ways said, Hey, you got to try it. You've got to try whatever's you got to scratch that itch. And I think it's the same thing. People that are further along in their careers and have a particular knowledge base or skill sets and they get that desire to start moving in another direction, just do it. I mean, the only yeah. the only thing you could do is walk away with an education, you right. know, or, or way more by accomplishing those dreams and goals. The other thing, too, if I can add this, Sean and, and Antonino, is, is stick with it because, you know, I can remember... It's funny because I jokingly say the years 2008 through 2012 are my lost years. You know, like I literally don't remember very much from those years other than working, going home to our, you know, our old house, working, maybe having a couple of glasses of wine here and there, but not doing too much of anything. But <clears throat> sticking with it, what ultimately happened is by sticking with this, we started to grow, and when, when Ashley and Jocelyn came on board, two women who added probably 10 to 15 years to my life, um, it got, it, it, you, you then started to see the, it, it grow, almost like that proverbial curve that goes like this and then has the steep incline. So it, sticking with it is, I think, important. And that's sometimes hard in, because we're in a program, we're in an era where we're all programmed immediate success, you know, look at sports. Somebody's hired as a coach or a manager. They're not getting the job done in two, three years. They're out, right? But the people who stick with a, 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 a successful plan or a, or a successful business, ultimately it does work out. So patience is another thing. Which I have none. <laughs> We're Italian. We don't have much patience. We don't have a choice. That's how we're <laughs> wired. Hey, we appreciate you coming on the Boss Juice podcast, Antonino and myself. And uh, we look forward to um, a lot of great years together. And uh, we wish this this amazing law firm all the best forward. Um, they're easy to find. Uh, www.nally-elias.com. Find thank these guys. guys. Both. Check them out. I'm sorry. I said thank you both. Thank you guys, uh, best yeah. of luck. Same this was you a guys. pleasure. So. Signing off to the next episode.